Hi. Um, Eileen, so maybe <laughs> I'll just um, I'll just start by saying that um, you know, I received this book probably about a month ago, something like that. I don't know if it was like late August or or September, but um, it came in the mail. And uh, it's one of those books that I just kind of knew immediately I had to drop everything and um, read it. <laughs> and there was a, uh, it was kind of, it was late, um, late afternoon, early evening. It was kind of, um, you know, uh, the sun was going down and um, there was the perfect setting um, because the, uh, the, the, the light was casting kind of shadows, a kind of little movie of leave um, wisteria shadows on the wall behind my bed. So I just, I sat on the bed in this pool of light with your book and, um, and I pretty much devoured almost all of it in one sitting. And um, it was, um, it was just, it was really um, exhilarating to read and, uh, you know, with with all of your writing, I find it's um, it's really infectious. It's um, it gives pleasure in in so many different ways. You know, just like the kind of pure pleasure of reading. Um, you know, this this pleasure that some people say you know is kind of like it's after childhood. It doesn't exist anymore. That where you just kind of like drop everything, <laughs> um, and. Um, but also it's just, it's really, it's inspiring. And, um, and I think it, um, it just, it, it, it makes me think about writing anyhow. And I, I, I would imagine it's probably true for a lot of people who read you. And, um, and it's, it's, it's very much a book about writing. It was written uh, um, initially as a lecture, right? For a series called Why I Write mm -hmm. at Yale University. And um, so it's very much about um, the spaces of writing, all, all the different spaces, in, including real estate. There's a kind of a big, you know, um, subplot about that. Um, it's about the time of writing, that it's sort of very much uh, indicated in the title for now, which you could kind of interpret as like, for now, like a placeholder, but it's also like, for now, this is the writing for right now. And um, there's a lot in here about wasting time, about the importance of wasting time, the importance of idleness as Virginia Woolf famously said. Um, and also just about all the different presence, like the different like um, uh, temporal sort of frames that, that you establish within the book, but, but it, it all just feels like so, you know, there's 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 writing about the past. There's writing about all these different presents. It all feels really much like in like it's happening in the now. Um, so um, maybe you wanna you wanna start by reading some parts of it. Absolutely. Um, and and I just I just have to say I just want to thank you so much for doing this. You know, and mm. I think because you had told me, and I I you know I love your work. You know visual art and and your writing so much and so but when you told me that when you got the book you just um, sat down and read it in one mm -hmm. fell swoop I knew that even if you couldn't do this conversation tonight it wasn't wrong to ask you mm -hmm. you know absolutely so, it's yeah but I'm very, it's my pleasure yeah and I'm very you know and um well I'll get to, I'll get to what I was going to say next later but um yeah so let me just read this one piece and actually you've got to help me a little bit when i after i've read it or maybe i'll know um okay in texas i have a map of texas on the wall in the kitchen i assume everybody thinks it's corny but i like to know where i'm where i am there are so many little buzzing sounds in my apartment it's a tiny place coming from both directions, sizzling in my ears. I have no doubt that I will go, if not now. And that's, I have to say, that's just alluding to the, the, the question of the book besides why I write is, um, 
my landlord is trying to evict me in the apartment that I'm sitting in right now in the East Village. So the dilemma of should I stay or should I go? It just, you know, and animates, animates the book in this funny way. Um, I have no doubt that I will go, just not now. By the time this is a book, a book called For Now, I decided this will all be resolved. Isn't that interesting? Meanwhile, I am thinking of departures, separation, loss. Robert Smithson was a big man for me for a while. I think we're the same person. He'd like that the Museum of Natural History had both spacemen and cavemen, which is very much like the Flintstones and the Jetsons, two kinds of time I participate in. Flintstones is drawing, Jetsons is the advanced postmodern form of writing in which all the versions of copying, even a single thought laid out in all its pictures can take hundreds and hundreds of pages of motion to make something truly fantastic occur. There are many kinds of awe. I wrote a whole novel about becoming a poet in New York, and at the time I was about becoming a poet in New York. And at the time I was being an academic in San Diego and returning desperately to New York as much as I could. People would look at me in the street like they do in New York. They'd say, are you here? I mean, I have been hearing people say this for 25 years, but I took it very personal at that moment because I felt the city had created me as a writer. And now in their idle remark, they were potentially taking it away. Yes, I'm here, I snorted. Or someone would allude to the fact that they were coming to do a reading in San Diego and they would giggle in an email as people do, I'm excited to see you in your new stomping grounds. Oh my God, the furor this unleashed in me. Nothing was worse than people trying to extract gigs from me now, like I was an academic, an opportunity for them to be on the road. One friend was hired for a semester as a visiting writer and at dinner she got trashed and sort of began pontificating about her work like she was actually the visiting writer and it was necessary at all moments for her to fulfill the terms of her work. My displacement in San Diego made me feel very vulnerable, though I know in my heart that you can write anywhere. I think though I wouldn't have become a writer if I didn't move to New York. I don't know if it's true, but I like that story. I just momentarily had a hard time spelling the word fulfill. It looks wrong, right? Is Brooklyn, New York? It's very political. I wonder about that now. There are writers I know who will never tell anyone when they travel that they are writers. People say, what do you write? Why don't we like that? Or they say, I always wanted to be a writer. Their eyes get kind of dreamy like the way photographers who take your picture are waiting for you to look. People think that you go to beautiful places to write and you're just living a life. And it's actually true. The part that sucks is that you're writing. I was just thinking I've written enough and maybe I'll charge my computer for a while and pack. I'll write a note. And then I start getting ideas. Writing is like my sex life. What I am is abstract. I'm happy to seem the dumbest thing in the world. And then I cut my eyes and wonder if you believe me. I've been doing what I consider not my work lately. Like I wonder what this is. Kind of in between, I suppose. Is it noble to say why I write? Is it a gig? But then do I have any religion at all? There's a point at which I don't care. And I'm there now. Dear diary. I've turned out introductions to books by important writers and artists, mostly females, some living, some dead. I did Chantal Ackerman. I did Kathy Acker. I did Gail Scott. I did Lynn Tillman. I did Conjue. I did Michael Lally. With Michael, I thought I had agreed to do a blurb. It's good to do things for men once in a while. I only say yes when I can't resist, but I can't resist too much. I'm always waiting to get here. Not here exactly, not Yale, but the place, whether it's a poem or my novel that I consider my work. But lately I've noticed a horrible thing. I almost prefer writing about the living and dead artists better. I've had enough of this. Not writing, but you know, a telling that resembles a story that details aspects of a self strangely similar to mine. People might say that's because you don't write fiction, but I do. Do you think this is, I don't know, whatever it is that fiction isn't? When my hand hits the keyboard, I'm lying. All of it is an alibi because I am so aware. I am aware not so much that my own becoming a writer is a construction of sorts, but more that there's a kind of aesthetic experience, I believe, that precedes the work so that you kind of fail into it, finding your style and content and opportunity all together at last. 
And that's happened enough times for me to believe that that's my process and it exists and will occur again, no matter how much suffering my work causes me and betrayal is so deeply a part of it because I'll be sailing along thinking, this is incredible. And days later, I'll stop and read some version of me that lives at a different pace. And some version of me that lives at a different pace reads what I've written and pronounces it bad. And I return to it later and pick out pieces and surges and rearrange it. So ultimately I'm talking about ease and how it is an other utter fiction. So I disbelieve all ideas about genre because it's all such fabricated stuff, writing, art, music. Every bit of it is not so much lying, but instead is perched in relationship to this other thing, which is living. And however I am doing it about it, and however I am about it, doing this thing, in my case, writing, makes that thing, I think, more beautiful. I have time for it. I am in it, and I am relentlessly talking about time, but I can feel it drumming. Rarely am I really peaceful. No, I'm happy, but I'm digging this little hole right here, which is really tearing a hole in the other thing, copying it somehow in a way I like, and that lets me fall out and relax in a way that I hope is nothing like the writer drunk at dinner telling us her stuff. That's great. I mean, I think it you, you touch on so many, um, you know, kind of key um, things, you know, in, 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 these, in these pages that, um, that really appeal to me. The, um, I mean, the, the whole idea of writing, writing about, you know, writing about the book that you're writing, writing how you write the book as you, as you write the book um, is, uh, is one, well, just the fact that it starts with a map of Texas, I love. Um, why? Uh, why? That's funny. Because I really, I really get it. Like I, I think it's it's really um, it's really necessary. Well, maybe not. It's helpful to like to situate yourself like that, especially in such a huge place as Texas, where like to get anywhere you have to drive like a minimum of six hours, right? To, right, and that's close. That's yeah, like and that's close. Yeah. Um, and also just like the way you move around to these different places, Texas, San Diego, um, you talk about the importance of New York City for you uh, as uh, in, in, in your formation as a writer. Um, and um, your whole kind of discussion about, you know, is it fiction? Is it, you know, is it not? Uh, and this line, you know, when my hand hits the keyboard, I'm lying. I'm, that's like, that is such a quotable. Line. Huh. <laughs> that's going to show up. I, that's going to show up in, in many places. Um, for sure. Um, it's such a great line. And um, it hits the nail on the head, I think. And then actually later in the book, you talk, you, you say something like writing is really a crime, which is kind, sort of, uh, a bit related, I think, mm -hmm. to, to the idea of uh, the idea of lying, um, uh, or that you know that it's all a fiction because it's all so mm -hmm. it's it's all so edited. It's it's mm -hmm. um, um, you know even people like Knausgaard who write everything are still writing fiction. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that the one that for me, the truest thing I said in the part that I just read was just the passing mention of the word ease, you know, that I think ease is the greatest fiction of all, you know, mm. because when people people consume, you know, any of our work and and what they really like about it is has this very relaxed quality or this vernacular mm. quality or this thing that it seems so kind of um, without labor you know yeah, and i think that, yeah. that ease is the thing that i know for myself i'm mostly constructing you know because yeah, you these patches yeah. where it's just like it was easy you know and then suddenly it's not and yeah. and you know a book is this edifice which is all these long patches of ease being kind of glued and stuck together you know mm -hmm. I, mean, I know you like robert walser there's some passage someplace that he wrote about saying that he's a cobbler or uh, mm. he jerry rigs all these things. And, you know, Walser was really important to me because I understood when I first encountered his work that bits and pieces is a way to go. It doesn't mm -hmm. have to be this one whole thing, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think it's so funny that we managed to create that illusion 
and then and then people and then you get that back you know yeah that, yeah that it seemed like it was just this kind of gesture yeah yeah no it's true i mean i i get i get the sense when i read you that it's just pouring out you know mm -hmm. but i also know that, that that's not true and that like you know you've you've talked about uh, somewhere else you talked about i hope you said something like um if I, if I know the transitions, I can write anything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and, um, um, and you know that from film editing. Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's about, it's about that. And, um, and then you also have another great line in this book where you say something like, God, God is in the repetitions, mm -hmm. um, which, which is such a nice twist on God is God, God is in the details because uh -huh. it's, um, you know, that, that repetition is such a big part of structuring a piece. Mm -hmm. Right, it's, right. It's a really, it's, it's really important. It's, there's something inherently gratifying uh, up to a reader, you know, when you have these, when you have these repetitions mm -hmm. and, um, cause it reminds you that you're home. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. It's, um, um, it's kind of wink, wink. It's always like, you know, you know what, you know, just like to hear it again means you're just being fed and now you can go to a different place again. So it's very parenting, a parenting, a paragraph or something. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And, um, but yeah, all, all of that is, um, that, that's definitely part of the labor that, that you're talking about. Yeah. And, um, and labor is so important too, because I feel like since it was in a way such a pain in the ass to write this book, you know, like I had to give this talk and the talk was an hour long and I just hadn't really thought it through. You know, I was getting a lump of money from Yale. So I was like, yay, I'm giving a talk. I'm getting this pile of dough that's good and I hadn't really thought about the fact that I actually when the talk was over I still owed them twice as much mm -hmm. as what I had given so that in a way it was fun to like drag the reader through me having to come up with that you know like mm -hmm. you know and we I mean I love you know I love writing always that that brings the writer the reader into the process but I felt like this felt particularly that mm -hmm. you know, yeah you know, like uh, now I'm here. Ah, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, because it was the it 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 was the opposite of ease. It was like, man, yeah. not easy, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there are all kinds of like twists and turns and even kind of like almost plot twists in 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 the book, like especially at the end. Well, maybe we should talk about that afterwards. But I I love how the, the way that you found to end this book. I just uh -huh. I think it it um it just um the first time i read it uh, uh it, made, it made such an impact on me it's like how did she do this how did she manage to do this that you you wrote an ending that was it all it just kind of doubled back on itself like you because oh. you you refer to everything that we've just read you know and and like i was saying before the there's all these kind of these like really sort of fascinating temporal kind of um, uh, switch temp temporal switching going on and mm -hmm. um, um, and I had to read that several times before I could even fully understand what what it, like what it was when when you be, when you talk about the archive, the, um, the piece that you wrote about the archive, but we can maybe come back to that. Um, um, and um, let's see what else. Um, uh, well, maybe do you, do you want to read again, or I have I have a few more questions, but you could also maybe. Read yeah, read how about one more? You have one more question. I mean, sure. Okay. Um, well, one, you know, you start at the very beginning, you talk about living beside a cemetery, like overlooking a cemetery. Right, right, right. Very, it's, it's a very beautiful and kind of ancient cemetery, right? Um, and then towards the end, you talk about being in the Beinecke Library and, um, and it, they have just acquired your 
archives and that was the first of two talks that you gave at Yale, correct? Like that where um, they had just acquired your archives and you went there and you, re or you read poems. It's a reading, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a reading, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I've, I've been in that building and it's one of the most striking buildings. I've, and, and the way you describe it is just so perfect because it's made of slabs of translucent marble, as I'm sure many of you know. And you, but you talk about being uh, inside a tomb, like your, your archives are entombed. And when you're there reading, you're also, you know, you're, you're under these marble slabs and, um, and you feel like you're in, um, in a tomb as well. So I just, I love those two images, you know, of the cemetery and the, the archivist tomb, you know, almost literally a tomb, you know, bracketing. Mm -hmm. And Acad Academy is tomb too. I mean, I just think I, I, you know, I, I, when I, when you told, told me that you liked this selection and I read it, I was like, I wonder what Maura likes. And I, I, there was one piece, which was, you know, which is San Diego, which is talk about tomb, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like, it's, I mean, pe places are so different. And I think New York, I, you know, I, I might be just ruined. I mean, I came to New York in my twenties and even, even as it changes and seems so wrong and messed up there's still some way that i associate new york with life mm -hmm. you know and i just mm -hmm. hit the street and i see people and just it's always you know it's the time thing you're talking about there's all these different times going on people are at all these different states and certain parts of town are more fruitful in that way you know but it's like it always makes me glad to be alive in some way and i you know it was so strange to like to be picked up as a person i think at 50 i was like hired by university mm -hmm. of california and just picked up our cot you know like they took the you know the interior of my apartment and my life you know I just brought it there and suddenly I was in this office and I remember sitting in this office thinking oh my god like mm -hmm. I was preserved and it was part of this flow towards something that meant that somehow you had been determined to have value and now you will be you know rescued yeah. and saved and it just felt like this kind of strange death and life thing which yeah. you know in san diego is because it's um climate controlled as a place it's yeah. like the temperature doesn't change and so it was really a great place to write a novel about the past in new mm -hmm. york because nothing ever interfered with my drift i would just could keep making the same kind of interval gestures every day because the weather just sat there being sunny and smiling at me it was mm -hmm. so weird and then of course it was in so many ways just a completely bounceless place. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever come to feel seduced by San Diego in any any way, even in like a perverse way? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I just think, I think the level of comfort and bourgeoisness and the fact that I was a professor, that I had a house, that the that the weather, you know, the, the dog beaches, the dog beaches alone. I mean, mm. what city has three dog beaches? Mm. You know, I mean, it was just, Though you know, sad, of course, my Rosie was dying at the time too. Yeah, it was like yeah. a great place for a dog to die. Yeah, <laughs> it's maybe a great bumper sticker about San Diego. You know, mm. um, yeah. So, so, somehow that that keys me. I can, I can read something. Okay. Um, Do you want to tell me what page? Yeah. Let's see. It's sort of towards the. Um, Yeah, okay, it's um six, page six. And okay, let's see what happens. Um it really takes so much time to become a writer and you have to be able to roll in time itself. That was my experience. It seems to me like a dog likes to roll in dead fish at the beach or a dog, my dog stands in the shit of a stable underneath the body of a horse trembling and it feels off because there's so much shit and there's so much horse. But if you're somebody that wants to do that with life, which is just waste your time moment to moment. I mean, it's great. I thought I was wasted being a poet. I threw the gauntlet down and what happened after that was nothing and nothing is where I work. I'll get to the why of it. 
I think literature is wasted time. I don't think there's anything good about it. It's not a moral project, except in this profound aspect of wasting time. I have had this adventure in all of these ways. It's the great adventure of our time. I guess you could be in this position by being wealthy or having a rich partner, though I don't think being wealthy, you would feel the same desperate intensity about living in this tiny preserve as one does if you're being poor and you found yourself in a situation like mine that was simply a convergence of class and history culture and on a personal level, lethargy, fear and procrastination so that you wind up there somewhere workable where you could simply live and then you simply couldn't move because where in the world was as cheap as New York if you lived among the class that lives this way, I suppose I'm talking about negative awe and all of that became your decor to some extent, even involuntarily relishing the fabric of being poor. I tell you endless jokes about it, but I'm not going to do that now. And I wasn't alone in it, my condition. There was an us to it. Now there's about three left. And when I go, there'll be two. My apartment is pathetic. It's an area from which I look down from my 300 square foot apartment from the position of bed. I literally espy the New York Marble Cemetery, a graveyard from the 19th century, which has been sort of like being young and then not so young and holding a skull all these years. And in that fragile and elevated space, I read and wrote and just kind of looked at things very slow. And my built-in bed is jammed right up against the window and I sleep on my right side. And anywhere in the world, if I can't sleep, if I can't remember what sleep is or how it works, I just think of the window. It is the original. I know it's not very American to have a home, to feel this way about a location at all, but this is the time I am in. Dogs, as we have learned, shit in relationship to the magnetic poles of the earth. So, shrug. I went to the ruins in Mexico in 1985, and in the Anthropological Museum, I discovered a writer, John L. Stevens, who wrote a book called Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan. There were a series of similarly named books. Through him, I became enamored with the idea of becoming a travel writer, of which he was among the first. Later, I discovered Robert Smithson and his Incidents of Mirror Travel in the Yucatan, Obviously, he was responding to Stevens to Mexico in his own condition of coming from post-industrial suburban New Jersey using stuff. He started off being a writer, but wound up more of a sculptor, conceptual artist, an earth artist. He made big and little things outside, and often he took pictures of them and installed versions of the entirety inside. His response to Mayan antiquity was to put tiny mirrors in it. He was a poet, after all. I had no access to this graveyard for a very long while. I just had a view. I'm going to go a little further here. Once I drunkenly climbed over the fence with my girlfriend and laid down on the ra raised gravestones and drank our beers and looked, looked at the stars. By around 2010, the Marble Cemetery began opening on the first Sunday in the month, May through October. I recommend it. And also a historic plaque has magically appeared on the, mat on the metal gate. And I discovered that John L. Stevens' remains are down there and had been right below my window for 30 years. And only last year on the TV show, The Billions, Axe and Wags were standing down there in the dock of my computer, warm on my stomach in bed. Wags was buying a plot. The contortions of here and elsewhere are endless and rich. Maybe I'll stop there. That's, uh, yeah, I love, I love this passage. This, I love these pages so much. Um, um, and yeah, what, what an amazing, coincidence to have uh, studied um, that writer in, in Mexico and then to discover him. Um, so the plaque just went up quite recently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was yeah. not, it was very, yeah, it was very, I mean, it, I do think, I mean, I think people say life is a dream for good reason, mm -hmm. you know? Because mm -hmm. it, somehow it's, sometimes it just seems in the same way that I, I think anybody I know who tells stories tell stories about a human existence that only they seem to have, you know, because mm -hmm. it's the pacing and the entrances and the exits. You were like, I remember reading about, um, what's his name? Um, Bruce Chatwin, who I really mm -hmm. was writing, I really love. And I read, I liked him so much. I read a couple of biographies about him and they said that he was just a tremendous liar. You know, mm -hmm. just like people would say, I was standing there and that didn't, nothing like that seemed to happen to me where Bruce just described but it was just this phenomena of there was just this such a thing as Bruce stories, you know, mm -hmm. and it was Bruce life. And I think I think with so when when something like that plaque 
turns up, I just think, okay, I, I, you know, I, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't a religious feeling, but it somehow is as aesthetic and spiritual as much as they meet and, mm -hmm. you know, that I think, okay, I mean, this is being written. It feels like it's being written and I am merely its scribe. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. Yeah. No, so I, I think cemeteries can be really generative that way. I've, I've had some, exp I also live overlooking a cemetery, Trinity really? Cemetery, oh. yeah. Um, and, um, I've I've discovered yeah I've discovered things and in, in other cemeteries that have led me on these, you know, great you know, um, circuitous, um, derive kind of paths to certain writers and um, yeah. Um, and there's a peculiar thing about what are the living doing among the dead too. You know, it's just like I was I was in Provincetown in August doing. Um, I started to become obsessed with the person who died there. And so I started doing all this research about her. And then I wanted to find her grave and she was buried in Provincetown. And mm -hmm. so I find, you know, I was wandering around that cemetery looking for her and mm -hmm. I found her and I felt so, it felt so personal and so worthy. Mm -hmm. And then I sort of scanned the cemetery and there were all these other people in the cemetery. And, and I knew that nobody there was looking for anybody. And it was so strange to think of it as this huge repository of human remains. And mm -hmm. mostly what we do there has nothing to do with that. It's just another kind of real estate that isn't used in a particular way. And so people jog through and ride through and make sure it's a there it's kind of it's a garden. I mean, they were the 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 first cemeteries were actually kind of modeled on gardens. And uh, that was the sort of that was the model. Yeah. Um, um, I've been in cemeteries with, a, I have a friend who's kind of like a diviner. She can find particular graves. Like I was with her in Père Lachaise and we were looking for Chantal Ackerman wow. everywhere. Yeah. And, and Allison was just kind of like going like this. <laughs> and eventually she put her finger wow. on the grave. Uh -huh. And and then another time I was in Montparnasse Cemetery looking for Chris Marker's grave. Mm -hmm. And I was texting with Allison the whole time. And she was online getting all these, you know, bits of information and clues and telling me which alley to and lo and behold, I found I found his grave. It was very um it was not obvious. Yeah, yeah. What yeah. it was. Um but I guess those are different cemeteries because so many famous people are buried right. there that people really do go looking. I was for. in the one in Berlin where um, 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 Brecht is buried. Mm -hmm. And then is it Heidegger, I think, is maybe also buried there. And I was, yeah. it's so funny, I was there with um, the poet Ray Amontrout. And, um, and later I was asked to blur Breck's collected poems. And I was just twisting myself into a pretzel trying to figure out how I could get the fact that Ray and I were at his grave into the blurb. And, and I can't remember if I did, if I tried and they were like, no, I think maybe I did finally put it there. And they were like, mm. we don't want to hear that. But it was so, it seemed so funny. And it seemed like such a wonderful kind of send off to this, you know, great artist, but also incredible pig towards women and it was just mm. funny to have these two female poets standing over his grave you know yeah no that sounds like a perfect blurb to me for, for him in another world yeah mm. um um you know i wanted to bring up i'm i'm uh, kind of jumping to another topic now but Good. um i wanted to bring up the um the 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 binders the 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 poems that mm -hmm. the box or the milk crate or whatever that contained right. all of your yeah all of your poems for decades you had you had a system of collecting all of your finished poems and only one copy existed in these binders in this box that you kept under your bed and and then when you started getting asked to move to all these different places the box started to move with you, and um, and you, ne you never you, you never thought it would it was necessary to have a a second copy of any of these poems because the box was always going to be with you. But mm -hmm. then suddenly it's not, <laughs> <laughs> and um, 
and you and and but in this book you write about it um, quite a bit about you know the, the disappearance of of this box and uh, you know it just it made me think I just I wonder was there I mean I, I yeah you say at the end that you you reconciled yourself to the loss of the of the box and but do you think that writing about it provided a kind of um, a replacement, a substitution. And um, like, is this, is this something that you, you do often where you lose something, but if you write about it, it's a kind of way of reclaiming it uh, yeah. a little. Yeah. yeah, I think that like, and of course it doesn't stick because I've still, you know, returned to like, ah, oh, the bar, mm. you know, and stuff. But I think on some deep, on some deep level, it did do that work. And it's so funny. I feel like the, you know, the, I can continue our, you know, like death theme. It's sort of like, I feel like this book or that, that um, the process of going through that narrative was sort of like my winding sheet, you know, it was almost like I made a corpse of that loss and then, and then kind of could shed the cloth and mm. be out of it in a way you know because I think that like I think part of when you lose something I think there's so much shame mm. you know it's sort of like not only did you lose something but you're the person that lost that the person who would do that you know mm -hmm. the person capable of that era you yeah. know so there was oh I think for me you know because of sitting in a community of writers and artists and um you know I just I didn't want anybody to know, you know what I mean? Like when mm. I was going through the process of trying to find this thing, I was contacting people but and people would say, why don't you put something on Facebook? And I was like, no, mm. you know, it would just be like declare, putting an asshole sticker on my forehead, just saying that I'm just such an idiot, you know? And so I think it's a, even the fact of telling the story, you know, and then I think we get very anal about where you put certain stories, you know, it's sort of like, even as I was publishing the book, it was like, shouldn't this be in my novel and went mm. through, you know, great permutations trying to make sure that I had permission to use pieces of that mm -hmm. in my novel so that I didn't entirely shoot the wad of the story here. But, but still, I mean, I just think the fact of um, exposing myself and yeah. shed, showing it. And I think the shame, the shame is in the holding and the hiding, I think. Yeah. And so yeah. when it starts to be out and, and, and you just really re experience all the permutations to the extent and it's like and even you know art is such a ritual it's not just it's just not it's not just telling it's all those things we know where you you're telling and you're holding back and you're a limit the, the very form of the telling is an aesthetic practice that is weirdly healing mm -hmm. it's sort of like even as I'm shedding and showing um withholding and shaping and yeah. so then it winds up being my, I mean, I, I don't know why I keep thinking of, now I'm thinking of grave again, you know, because, we, you know, I've made a, a will. Have you made a will? And among the things you do in a will is say, what's going to happen to your remains? Mm. You know, and I think that, that I think dealing with the hurt has something of that deciding. It's a, it's a, um, I think one of the, is it narrate? I think the word narrate, one of the earliest, it's like a Scottish um, it, it's like one of the earliest uses of the word narrate is at the beginning of the will. It's a Scottish word mm. that says who will get certain things, Okay, you know? So I just yeah. think that the narrative itself is, is full of, of, um, I don't know, grieving and naming and listing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, yeah, I think it was an amazing thing to have done. I could, you know, I could care. And now I'm sort of waiting, I'm kind of smug waiting for people to, you know, talk about it in the world or some way, you know, but, but I've, you know, but I've done my practice mm. of it, you know. You have one, you mentioned one good friend or, or maybe a, 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 um, a girlfriend who kind of, who lets you off the hook, who kind of says, uh, okay, good. It's a good thing. Now it's gone and you can it move on. Filmmaker, or the Palestinian filmmaker. Okay. You know? She okay. was like, it's amazing. It's wonderful. Mm. Now you can let go of it, you know? Mm. And that was so, you know, and then I also thought of, um, you, you must have heard of the Mexican suitcase, right? Um, I don't know. What? It's a, I mean, I think ICP has- Oh, yes, I know what you're talking about. Yes, yes. Yeah. 
So of course I do have, you know, like from I have the Spanish Civil War. Is that yes photos? Yeah. It was just a suitcase that was found that people yeah. couldn't believe. And they were famous, many of them were famous photos, but these were the original, you know, yeah. negatives and and just like it showed up in some thrift sh shop in Mexico yeah. City. And you know, and so part of me is letting it go, but also letting it go to the future. Like right. we could find this. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yep, someone could be sitting on it somewhere just waiting <laughs> for something um do you um do you have a reluctance in general to look you know to, to look back to go into the archives to organize a selected poems or collected poems like is it something that you that you would rather avoid that you would rather just like always be in the now and the new and the, the thing that's yet uh, that's yet to be written yeah i mean i was i mean i was very obsessed with ma the making of a selected because i felt like i was you know and it's again it was like part and parcel of this this lost archive without knowing was was to create an archive that was you know not my possession that it would get published and go into the world and be be safe beyond my hands you know but um but i know but i think if there are future you know obviously i've just i've written a lot and so there's all kinds of books that would be you know putting together all the art writing putting it all mm. you know and i've done when i did um my iceland book it was a certain kind of gathering right, right. and it was so much work you know yeah. for, for one thing because we've moved through so many formats you know, and yeah. something just Xeroxes and have to be retyped and other things are on this, you know, like in this form that doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. it's just like, it's all, it's yeah. all different ways we have of sharing and holding things now. And it's just like, it's such an effort to yeah. pull those things together. It's you know? exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not excited about looking back again to do new, another of those kind of, kind of books. Yeah. yeah like there's some questions here we, should we look at them in the chat yeah um let's see um, why don't you pick one and i'll okay. here if you need help but okay absolutely um, fine for you to do it too yeah maris if you see one that you love please let's let's all yeah. here's one from briar that i love um okay. I, you write in a lot of different mediums and I'm wondering what drives that difference. Are there some things which only make sense in poetry or only make sense in prose? How does the subject inform the form? Yeah, um, I just think that they're just not separate. I mean, I think they, they tend to come, they tend to come not fully dressed, but they seem, they tend to come in their form. You, you know, I mean, like poetry just has this, um, I don't know, kind of, subliminal feel like it just kind of a, a poem just kind of seizes me in a way that that I might have a good idea for a piece of fiction or I might be working on um, another kind of writing and it's like it's a thought and you got to write the note down to remember that idea and the whole is attached to it but poetry is so literal it's like a piece of the thing it's sort of like you don't get an idea about the poem what's yeah I mean I guess that but mostly it is the poem itself comes and it's very um unbidden and so it's very clear when it's that and you know other things that there you know it's interesting it's an invitation like this book was the result of an invitation so know what you're doing because they asked for it you know and i think that the, the the pleasure then is to kind of fuck with the invitation you know to say okay i'll do that but i'll do it in a way that you know like undoes some aspect of the invitation itself or at least fulfills my need to do that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. How how was it received when you gave when you gave the talk? It was good. I mean, I was nervous, as, you know, for all these class reasons. I mean, Yale is just very, you know, and it was um, I had all these fears that I wasn't smart enough that I was going to be, you know, and academics make me nervous. I was very nervous when I was in San Diego because there's such a way of dis discourse, this language, this particular way that people mm -hmm. say things, you know, and you feel like um, there's always a fear of not being heard. So yeah, but it was very, it was very well received. It was, it was exciting. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I was very happy to, to do it and be done too. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the problem with excitement is that it suggests that something's over. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, you, you, really, you really made it into something um, completely unique and, um, and you added so much to it. And uh, like I was saying before, there were like, there's just these kind of great little plot twists that, that really, um, that make it really thrilling to read. Do you know what's what's that um, Austrian writer's name? Thomas Bernhardt. Have you a mm -hmm. fan? Of it? He has that great book of my awards, a book of just speeches he gave when he got awards. And oh, I don't know. That. I was very inspired by it because he's so funny and he talks yeah. about his outfit and he he just it's it's mm. very very narrowly and um and of course beautifully written. Um, that sounds good. Now, do um, we have any other questions yeah. here? Um, yeah, wants to know if you could talk more about compromise, where you choose to compromise and where you refuse. Oh, isn't that interesting? Um, well, I think I think you I think you're always I I'm always trying compromise on. It's like I always feel like I would if I could, you know. So I think when I've I've thought I think of it a lot in terms of like say selling books when I've you know I think transitioning from being a poet to a novelist, there was an expectation that I would make big bucks and I would get the money, you know, which is not the case as to this date. But um, so I would be, I would write a novel and then I would either get a suggestion and then I would try it, you know, and, and, and sometimes it would seem like a wonderful thing or sometimes it would seem like an awful thing. And then very often it still didn't make a difference. You know what I mean? They would say the beginning's depressing, take off the beginning. And I would take off the beginning and then they would be like, nah, you know? And then I, then I would be left with the question of whether it's better with or without the beginning. You know, so I feel like part of me is very willing to play footsie with capitalism, but, but, um, but it will only stick if it's the, if, if the, the, request to make it more marketable actually just makes it a better thing you know i'm still kind of stuck with my um you know my own brothers you know mm. here's a question from anna dear eileen i would love to hear more about the idea of home in repetition and something like the memory of your window as un-American, if you felt like talking about that anymore. I really enjoy in your writing the sense of finding some kind of home in unexpected places. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think home, home means the familiar, I think. And so in language, I think what's, you know, when we use the word metonymy, I think we're talking about um, a kind of writing that sets up a web, of a kind of a communal web. Like once you hear something, um, it, it, it kind of makes a contact. And then when you hear it again, you're part of the us that has been there before. And you feel kind of endorsed in your presence and your presence as a reader and your presence as a communicator. And then, I mean, it's sort of like when you, when you work with like new writers and it seems like any exercise that, that plays on this, um, like ways of making there be like a limited language so that we all know that we're, you know, we're drawing from the same sources of language. And so we're all in on the joke when the same, when the word ostrich keeps coming up again and again. And why does everybody like the word ostrich? And, and strangely, part of the nickname of that group of people winds up being ostrich, you know, or, you know, in, in, a, in a workshop, somebody would write a poem that you were like, you literally get nicknamed by, by, the repetitions you choose, you know, or by the mm. way people started to think you, of you that way, you know? But I think, you know, it's all the things that we know, like whether it's prayer or, I mean, the first time I ever read Rimbaud, I thought, oh my God, he's such a Catholic. Because mm. I could just feel the cycles of prayer in the poem. And even mm. if they weren't little repetitions, you could feel a circularity that felt like the chant or the incantation of religious texts. Um, so I think there's something very embodied in certain rhythms, too, that feel like home, you know, whether the word appears or not, you know, mm -hmm. you can feel its presence and its absence. Mm -hmm. Here's, here's a, a um, someone who liked what you said, and she, she loves it so much that I, I would hope that you would uh, speak more about it. Lauren says, fuck with the invitation. She loves that mm -hmm. so much. Tell us more about fucking with the invitation. 
Well, I mean, I think that just leads to the, the compromise question again. It's sort of like <laughs> being, being invited to come someplace, but then they're not really having any control over your behavior once they're in the room. Once they've, well, once they've welcomed you, you get, to, you get to do your dance and you get to play it your way. So I think, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's um, I mean, I think we're always, you know, I, I went to workshops when I was in my 20s and I remember being appalled. I mean, I think I, I've said this a lot when Alice Notley first gave us assignments. I was like, how dare she? You know, like I know how to write a poem. I don't need to like do her, you know. And then it was so interesting to see how stimulating it was to respond. I mean, it was like school where they would ask you to write about something. And I remember I was funny growing up and I would I would often write the very funny response and as far as you could push it in Catholic school. I think there's that too, coming from a very repressive background. Um, I have, I am drawn to obedience. And then once, once I begin the act of, submission i i you know i kind of undermine myself or undermine my willingness to be good or to to show up in that particular way so i think that just like you can you can really have it both ways and i think i think that is in a way the first sophisticated idea um i ever had you know mm -hmm. is to hold these two things in your mind at once and 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 perform it mm -hmm. yeah doesn't always work though. Sometimes, you know, I mean, I've had editors who they ask you to write about something and I write a piece explaining why I won't. And they, their response was, well, thank you. And they didn't use it. I was like, oh, I mean, that was British. I was like, wow, every American editors let me tell them why I won't do something and they accept the piece. But it was a, a British editor who just politely thanked me. And I thought that mm. is such a fuck you, you know? Mm. God. Um, yeah, I would, I would think that would be a really interesting <laughs> response to get, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, silence so often just comes in, I mean, power and silence are so intertwined, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't always know that I have that to use. And it's, it's, it's intense when you encounter somebody who knows exactly how to use that. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so have we come to the end? Um, let's yeah. see. Last chance for questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, we still um, tell yes. People um, can buy Mora's book. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll repost for now and index cards. Let me do that. Um, Somebody loved that I wrote. Billions. I will just say that was as that was as weird as the plaque to actually be lying in bed and to have these dudes on a TV show in the <laughs> in the cemetery out my side my window. It was just it was beyond it was beyond what we're talking about even. It was very weird. So stop watching that show. Um, well, I think maybe just to thank everybody. Um, yeah Maura thank you so much this has been oh uh, yeah thank you for asking me I really enjoyed it cool and I if you ever want to um his here's Moira's book right here which mm. is called index cards and it's it's such a um it's such a it's it's all these kind of headers and it just goes mm. in all these different directions it's such a reader's book it's it's mm. kind of an amazing compendium of all sorts of things that you've never you've thought about and have not thought about and you have a very particular way of describing things it's like and it, and it feels like your photography so it's mm. pretty great thank you thank you so much moira and eileen thank you so much thank you to this audience um buy some books um and thank you so much yeah thanks McNally. thank you maris okay thank you maris okay bye bye, bye.